Thank you. So I will speak in English, even though I'm originally from Belgium. I used to speak French, but I have been in the United States for 25 years, and I have never done statistics in French. So I would get very confused if I tried to give this presentation in French. But uh, Guillaume, has, uh, Guillaume Chauvet has translated the, the presentation, so the text is in, in, in French. Um, this is to offset the presentations that had English slides and French text. I'm, I'm doing the opposite. So this is joint work with my colleague Jay Bright and our um, PhD student who has since graduated, uh, Daniel Hernandez. Um, and so I have a very short outline. I'm going to spend a bit of time on the application itself because it's, it's an interesting application and I need to give the context for this somewhat strange estimation procedure. Um, then I'm going to talk about a distribution that you might not be familiar with called the projected normal distribution. And then finally, I'll talk about the small area estimation um, application specifically. So the context is um, a um, survey I have been involved with uh, together with uh, Jay for several years called the Marine Recreational Fisheries Statistics Survey. Um, I'm going to call it MRFs because that's what they call it. Um, and it's a um, survey of recreational fishing. So it's fishing, but it's recreational. It's not professional. And it's um, marine fishing, so it's only in the ocean. And this is a survey that's being conducted by uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and the goal of the survey is to estimate the catch by species um, from recreational angling. And um, this is part of estimating the total catch, both professional and recreational, to um, decide or estimate the size of the stock with which they set fishing quota. Uh, and so back in 2006, there was a National Academies of Science review of this survey, and they said what you're doing is completely incorrect. And it was incorrect because they were not using any um, weights or any adjustments for the clustering, the unequal probability, the stratification, they were not using any of those factors. So, so the estimation was, was biased and so since then they have been working on improving this survey. And I, I ha together with Jay we've been working as a team of consultants to help them correct their survey. Okay, so the MERVs um, the part I'll be talking about is all those states that are in, in color. Um, and basically, it's all of the Atlantic coast of the United States, as well as the Gulf Coast. Texas does not participate, because Texas does not like to participate in anything that has to do with the federal government. And the uh, Pacific ones are done separately, not by MRFs. Um, so I will not talk about those. Um, so that's, that's the survey. Um, and so the MRFs is, in fact, two different surveys. One is called the Access Point Angler Intercept Survey. That's an intercept survey. They go to the fishing site, they intercept an angler, and they ask the angler what they caught, how many, you know, how long did they go, etc. So that's one survey. Uh, and with this survey, they estimate the average catch per trip. So. Uh, Excursion is the way we decided to translate trip. So average catch per trip comes from this first survey. The second survey, a coastal household telephone survey, it's a telephone survey. They call households and they ask them how many trips did they take over a two-month period. And then the estimate for the total catch is average catch per trip times total number of trips. And the reason why they do it in two pieces is because if you ask people who are fishing how many trips, that's clearly biased because the more people fish, the higher their chance of being intercepted. And so it's common in fishery service that they do it in this, this two-component fashion. Okay, so um, for the first one, for the intercept survey, the um, estimate that they would like to use and that they are using going forward is what I wrote down here as the Horvitz-Thompson form. So first we have a selection of site days. 
So these are um, fishing sites and days within a two-month period. So they select a random sample of site days, and that is an unequal probability sample, and it's proportional to um, fishing pressure, and that's a known quantity. So the pi 1s is known, and so we can weigh with that. The problem is the second one, the pi t given s, and that is the probability of an angler to be intercepted on a given site day. And there, that is unknown. And it's unknown because um, they only go for a few hours, say, from 2 to 6 PM. They go to the site. And during that time interval, they interview n star anglers out of n observed anglers. But they're supposed to represent capital N anglers for the whole day. Because they select site days, but they only go for a part of the day. And again, going forward, they're adjusting for this because they're randomly selecting a four-hour interval. So going forward, we're going to be able to do this correctly. The problem is going backwards, we don't know that. So, so the second weight is unknown. So we're getting closer to the actual application because we what we're going to do essentially is estimate, so let me just go back. So we're going to estimate the pi t given s that we don't know. And the way we're going to do that is by using the data from the telephone survey, the CHDS. And there we have a very large data set of almost one million trips that were taken over the last you know, 18 or so years that we had access to when we did this. So from this, we can estimate the distribution of when anglers leave the fishing site, the departure time. So it's not departure when they go fishing, it's departure when they leave from fishing. Because that's when they would have been interviewed, right? They come back from the fishing trip, they get intercepted, they get interviewed. So we want to know when are people leaving the fishing site. Um, and so that, that's the data we're going to use to come up with, with an adjustment. And so the, the data we have available is the departure time, um, the fishing mode, because they want to estimate by mode. And the modes specifically are not very important. But basically, the shore mode is people who fish from the shore. And the other three are different boat modes when they go out to fish. Um, the wave is a two-month period, so we have six waves and four modes, and we have 17 states. And so we're trying to estimate the distribution of when people leave the fishing site by those factors. And so I'm going to call that F sub S. And so with this F sub S, you can estimate this probability, or I shouldn't say a probability. We can estimate the fraction of anglers that can be observed in a given time interval. Okay, so uh, as an example, they, um, if they go from 2 to 6, which is a common time, this way we can estimate that the anglers they see between 2 and 6 represents 80% of the expected anglers that would have been there over 24 hours. They tend to go at a busy time. So that's the goal. We're going to estimate this FS. And the data, they look like this. This is very small, but um, remember, we ha this is one state, state one, and I forgot what that is, um, Alabama or something. Um, and so we have four modes and six waves. And so the first mode is the shore mode. And what you can see there is that people really do fish 24 hours. Some people go at night to fish. Some people go during the day. And the boat modes are much more centered in a specific interval. They go out at a certain time, they come back just in a little window. And the other thing you see, hopefully if you can see some of those numbers, is that the sample sizes are very different. Some are very, very small. The one at the bottom there, um, state one, wave six, mode two, we have six observations. But the one right next to it, we have 500 observations. So the sample sizes are very uneven in this. Some of those we have thousands of observations. Some of them we have very few. But those are the data. And so our goal is to estimate this particular distribution. So this F, N, I, J, K, 
This is the, fr the fraction of departures in a cell defined by state wave mode, the fraction of anglers who leave in a time interval theta zero, theta zero plus delta. So that's our finite population quantity. And so a possible estimate from the CHGS is this design-based estimate, which is just the observed fraction that leave in an interval. Um, this is unbiased because it's design-based from the CHGS. The problem is, um, as you can tell, the small area estimation problem. In some cells, we have very little data. Some are completely empty. So we want estimates for all of those cells. So what I'm going to describe our procedure is, first of all, uh, the data are circular because it's time of day. So we're going to use a circular distribution to estimate the, 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 the departure distribution because we don't want anything to happen at midnight. I mean, if you saw those, those, those um, distributions, we don't want something that's going to have a big break at midnight. So we're going to use a circular distribution. Um, I'm going to use a Bayesian method. You'll see why, just for, for feasibility. We're going to have latent variables. Then it's easier to do Bayesian. And then I'm going to talk briefly about the so-called variational Bayes, which is kind of a new way to compute Bayesian estimates. And we had to do that here because we have one million observations. Uh, regular methods did not work. Um, and then finally, I'm going to do a small area estimation approach to adjust for departures from that distribution. Okay, so the projected normal distribution is actually kind of an interesting distribution. Um, it's a very natural one, uh, but it's not a usual one for circular data. Circular data, people typically think von Mises. Um, this is actually, um, I think, a, a better one for a number of reasons. And so basically what you do is you take a bivariate normal with um, identity, variance covariance matrix, but the mean is, is um, a, a parameter. So you take this bivariate normal in two dimensions, and then you transform to polar coordinates, and you just keep the angle. So you get rid of the length of the vector, and the angle is a circular distribution. And because it comes from a normal, it's going to be unimodal, symmetric, etc. cetera, um, but it's now circular. And this is a you know, very old distribution. It just hasn't been used a lot in statistics. Um, and the funny thing about this distribution is I have two parameters, right? I have mu1, mu2, the two dimensions of the mean vector. And together, they kind of serve the role of both mean and variance. So you still have a two-parameter distribution. And you can see this because what I did here is I took the vector mu, same direction, but different lengths in those two little plots. And what you can see is that the first distribution with the mean far away, I have a mean direction and the variance is small, right? And the second one, I have the same mean direction, but it's closer to the origin. So this is the same mean, but a much larger variance, variance of the angles. So it's a two parameter normal type distribution. And um, the reason why I'm gonna use this one is first of all, I'm using a normal distribution. So if I wanna do regression, I know how to write a, a regression model for a normal distribution, so it's, it's much easier to use. Um, you also get all your moments, you get your full conditionals, so everything is, is from the normal family. The problem is it's only partly observed because um, I observe the angle but not the length. So if I have a data set of a thousand observations, I have a thousand latent lengths. So I have to do quite a lot of um, um, either modeling that explicitly or use a Bayesian formulation. Okay, so let's just do that now. So, um, so I'm gonna not make any difference between hours and angles. You know, it's just, it's just multiplying by something. And so if I have a projected normal distribution, my uh, mean <coughs> vector or my, my parameter is mu, it's bivariate, remember? So I can do a regression model on this bivariate vector. So it's a, it's a bivariate regression model. Um, and so that was studied in 1998 in JASA, a paper, and they called it a spherically projected multivariate linear model with an abbreviation that didn't catch on really, but it's there. So they're the first ones that use it in statistics. And then there's two papers 
by um, a set of authors from um, Mexico, actually, who did the Gibbs sampler for this. And so here's the Bayesian version of this model. And uh, I should definitely say I'm not a Bayesian, so if I use terms that are not correct, um, with apologies to people who are more familiar with this, but basically it's the, it's the normal regression model with conjugate priors for everything. And so here's my mean, this is my, uh, this is my, um, my intercept, right? And uh, then I'm gonna have a, um, a normal value for all of the categorical variables. And so this is, a, this is the mode and it's gonna be normal. And then I have my, um, this is my state, this is my wave. And what I'm gonna play with is whether I'm gonna use them as fixed effect or random effect. If something is a fixed effect, I'm going to have a flat prior with this sigma square m very big. If it's going to be a random effect, I'm going to have one more level in the hierarchy. I'm going to have this sigma square s with its own inverse gamma, etc. So it's the, it's the traditional um, regression model, Bayesian regression model formulation. The only one that is unusual is this one right here, which is the... Um, conditional for the latent lengths. And remember, I have one of those for every observation. But it's an explicit form, and I can sample from it. Okay, so we did this, and we did the Gibbs sampler, and since I am giving a Bayesian talk, I have to show you some MCMC chains. Um, and so if we just did the model I said, this is the chains. So you see they're terrible. And remember, there's two because it's bivariate, right? So for every factor, I have two levels, so the chains were going everywhere, they were not converging. It turns out we had to center all of those variables, so we center them, right? So we basically take, we center them all around zero, and then everything that's left goes in the intercept. So this is the new centered intercept, this is the new centered mode effect, new centered state effect, etc. So we centered everything, and then these are the chains you get. So you get proper MCMC chains. Um, it works, but it's much too slow because it takes about two seconds for one draw. And remember, we wanted to do model selection, and so it just wasn't feasible to do this. Okay, so this is um, something that I'm going to go over fairly quickly, but it's for people who are interested in Bayesian estimation, this is quite interesting. It's called variational Bayes, and it's a truly new way to do Bayesian inference because Bayesian inference traditionally are variations on stochastic chains where you get something that stabilizes and then you get draws, random draws from some sort of posterior. Here, it's throwing that completely away and it's replacing it by a deterministic approximation. Um, and so you don't have anything that you don't, you're not converging, you're not burning in, you're not doing anything. You just numerically approximate a posterior. And the way they do that is actually very simple. They take this high dimensional complicated posterior and they come up with a simpler approximation, typically by cutting this multivariate distribution into univariate distributions and then find the best approximation. This has been around for a long time in computer science. It's new in statistics. So I'll just describe it and I'll use the notation that is traditional in variational methods. They use omega for the parameters and they use Q for the posterior. Um, sorry, not for the posterior. Q is the variational approximation. And so what they do is, you can see it, right? So they take the complicated posterior. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to approximate it by this product of univariate distributions. And the... Um, Variational approximation is defined as the one that minimizes the KL distance, which is a perfectly reasonable um, criterion. And it's a very simple identity to show that minimizing the KL distance is the same as uh, maximizing this lower bound, which is below, which is much easier to compute. Um, and so what it is is basically, it, this is the joint distribution of the data and the parameters this is the variational distribution, and you minimize this. And so this is your criterion for this um, variational method. And it turns out that the solution can be written, the solution satisfies those equations. And they, they look messy, but if you look inside of those things, 
This is a full conditional. This is this parameter given all the other parameters and the data. So it's a full conditional. And this expectation is the expectation over everything except that first parameter. And again, if you have the conditionals, these things are actually computable. And so the, what um, Wand and Omerod said, every time where you have something where you can do Gibbs with all of the conditionals, you can set this up. And you very of, of, often get simple forms that you can actually easily write this down and numerically solve it. And then you use this lower bound to find, to, to assess convergence of this algorithm. And so I'll just show you the simple case here. And I'm, I'm going to simplify it a little bit by doing the um, non-regression case, right? So I'm just saying mu, single parameter mu. And so what we have is, if I take those equations, I can rewrite them like this. And so what you see now is that the variational posterior for mu is just a normal distribution, and we know how to use a normal. And the variational distribution for R is this particular form where um, my student, Daniel, basically come up with the moment generating function, so we, we get the moments as well. And so the only thing that is unknown in here is the mean of R, because everything else is known, and here everything is known except the mean of mu. So you can rewrite this algorithm as an algorithm that just computes those two means over and over until it converges. Very simple, takes a second. And so here they are, this is the algorithm in terms of the means. And so it's, it's very, very simple to compute. And um, in this particular case, um, we prove that it converges to the mode of the posterior. So that's, that's the good part. The not so good part is that uh, it's very good, and this is always true for variational methods. They're very good at finding the center. They're not good at finding the spread. And so what you see here, just a little simulation, where the, the, the true posteriors, this is the histograms. You can see them, right? This is for uh, large variance, small variance. And the variational posteriors don't respond to the variance at all. So they get the mean, they don't get the variance. So what we did is we added a Laplace step. So we do the variational to find the centers. And then we do a Laplace approximation to find the variance. And I'm just going to go through this. And then it does it right, right? The original tall ones are the variational approximation. The ones that are closer to the histogram are the variational followed by one step Laplace. And so we did this, and it takes, it goes from you know, hours to get a fit to you know, less than five minutes. So we did this. Um, and so then we did model selection to find what's the right model for this. And so we tried different formulations with interactions, without interactions, with mixed effect, with fixed effect. We added a household effect because the trips are clustered by household. So we tried all that. And um, we did the DIC to find the best um, fit to this. And, you know, the, the details are not really important, but the, the model we ended up picking is the one that's right here, which has a fixed effect for mode, which makes sense because trips, shore versus boat are truly different in their distribution. And then we had a random effect for the state wave interaction, which again also makes sense because, you know, if you go way north, the behavior over time is very different than if you go to way south, where it's much less dependent on time of year. So this is a very reasonable um, model, and so we picked that. And then this one is the one with household effect. If you look at the DIC, it's tiny bit smaller, but then we have a household effect, which you really don't want. So we went back to this one. All right, so now let me go to the, um, how did we use this to compute those, um, those actual distributions that we're going to use. T tell me how much time I have just to, Okay, good. So I'm, I'm, I'm about right. So under the, normal distribu under the projected normal distribution, it turns out that if I want to find the CDF for a certain um, time interval from theta to theta plus delta, that is only a function of this mean parameter, right? 
So um, thinking like a Bayesian, if I have a posterior for the mean, I have a posterior for any time interval I can specify. The problem is, you know, I would have this, this integral to compute. And so the way I would do this normally is to say, I'm going to randomly draw mu's from the posterior. So I, I, I have a posterior from the variational approximation. I can draw from that, and then I can come up with the posterior for f. Um, it's, again, not very practical. So instead, what we did is, first of all, we're going to simplify the problem by just coming up with the 24 one-hour um, CDFs. So instead of having any possible interval, I'm just going to estimate 21, uh, sorry, 24 time slices. So that's one simplification, the biggest one. And the other one is it turns out you can come up with an identity like this, which says, so this is theta, theta plus pi over 2. So this is six hours. So for six hours, I don't have to compute the, the integral. I can actually just compute it directly from um, CDFs of the normal distribution. And so then, instead of having to compute 24 integrals, I just have to find five integrals, and then I can just difference for all the other 19. So that's just computational to make this practical. Um, and so then here is the result. So here is um, one state, um, different wave mode combinations. And so these are the projected, the blue are little tiny box plots for the projected normal pos uh, posteriors, okay? And so um, what you see is that it really responds to the spread of the data, but you can also see that it's really not a good fit. I mean, if, if this is supposed to be a fit to the data, the projected normal model is not very good. Um, it's very precise. This is just one of them, just to show it a little bit bigger. So these little posteriors are very tight because they're based on one million observations. So the variance is very small, but the bias is very big because it doesn't fit well. So that's why we decided to do um, a small area estimation approach where we're going to use um, this posterior. This is the posterior. Um, as kind of a overall grand mean model, and then we're going to allow deviations from that by using deviations between this and this. So this is the design-based estimate. This is my model-based estimate. And first we did kind of a um, composite estimator, and so this is a, a Fay Harriot version. So let me do that. So what we did is we set up a Fay Harriot area-level model, um, but a little bit of a simplified one. Because instead of having, so if you think Fay Harriot, what I would normally have is this is my um, design-based small area mean. This would be my X prime beta, my linear regression um, component of my Fay Harriot model. This would be the random effect for the small area. This is the random effect, um, the pure error. Okay, so this is the Fay Harriot formulation. And so then, again, Fay Harriot, this one, these errors are supposed to be known, and these are supposed to be the small area errors that I'm going to estimate. So I'm going to estimate this variance component. Um, and so my blob, if you want to think of it that way, would be what I'm going to try to target is this. So this is my, remember this is from the projected normal. This is the deviation from the projected normal. So I'm going to do a blob, and I'm going to do the Bayesian blob. Um, and well, let me, I'll just show it to you in the next one. Okay. All right. So the usual situation is that um, I'm going to replace this by my design-based V hat. That's what is typically done. This, there's this D, which normally wouldn't be there, but there is a D because, remember, these are um, fractions, right? So the variance is very small. When the fraction is very small, then... This gets big when you're close to 0.5, then goes back to almost zero at the edges. So this is basically the P1 minus P type variance, inflator, deflator. And so that way, the only parameter is this sigma. And so once it's set up, this is just very simple, Gibbs, very quick. So we did this. 
And this is then the result. And what we have in here is, um, thank you. What we have in here is, this is actually the, the same four plots. I'll just go back because the, these are a little easier to see. So I, I'll go back here, right? And um, this was just the projected normal. So now, it's a little small, but the red dots are the projected normal distribution. The black dots are the observed distribution. And the blue dots are the uh, blob. Okay? And so what you can see is that in the first one, where we only have 19 observations, the blue looks a lot like the red. And the other extreme is the one down there that has 4,861 observations. Um, the blue is very much like the black. It's just slightly shrunk. So it, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do, which is if you have lots of data, it's close to the data. If you have little data, it's close to the projected normal. So it's doing the trade-off that we wanted it to do. OK, so this is very busy. But what this is is basically the, the output from the whole project. So what this is is four, four modes, six waves. And in every one of those, there are 17 or up to 17 curves, which is the 17 states. So this is the output that we gave to the government agency to said, with this, you can compute all your weights. And it's not really obvious, but maybe you'll see it on, on top here. There's not as many curves. And there's a blue one in the middle. And there's not 17 curves here. So what this is, is in some cells, you don't have any observations. So then your, um, I guess, Feheria predictor will just be the grand mean, which is back to projected normal. So this blue curve is the projected normal in that cell. So because we, if you had an empty cell, it goes back to the model. And there's um, nine cells where we had to do this. All right, so, so now I'm unwinding. I'm, I'm talking about how we use this. So um, remember, we did this whole work just to come up with a weight that we could use to weigh the APAIS data. And so um, we fit this model. And then eventually, we come up with this quantity, which is the small area estimate based on the projected normal for any site that's in this state wave mode um, combination. And the only thing we did is we had to do some rounding. So if somebody was there from 2.15 to um, 5.45, we would round to the hours to do this. OK, so this is my, my last slide. So um, we did this, and we provided those numbers to uh, NOAA. And so they have used this to weigh their past data, where they didn't have weights. Um, and we also published or, or wrote an article. This is part of the student's dissertation, and it's currently under review. Um, and it's by statistics, but we'll see. Um, and this procedure worked. It gave us estimates. But it's clearly there's some ad hoc steps, right? Um, the, the model was not a good model. And so then we had to do model plus small area estimation. And from a Bayesian perspective, what is not satisfying is that we're not accounting for all the variability. Because we used the mean in one model, plugged it in in the other model, so we never accounted for that variability. So, so the, the variability didn't go all the way through. Um, there's not much variability, but in terms of the model, that's, that's not a satisfactory step. So then what we did, and we're still working on that part, is to say, can we have a model that accounts for everything that's happening. And what we're doing there is instead of doing a projected normal in a cell, we're doing a mixture of projected normals in a cell using a Dirichlet process prior, which um, lets you automatically pick how many components are in each of them. So that's, that's ongoing work um, that will avoid the second Feheria step. But it's, it's not done. So thank you. I'm, I'm finished. Merci Jean. Donc on a une ou deux questions. Michel I'm not going to go into the small area, but in the sampling, I was wondering, in network sampling, could that be used instead of the sampling? In other words, you ask the fisherman, well, does he know other fishermen in the area? Around that time, so that would give you a chance to get more fishermen. 
I missed the first part. So okay, uh, it's about network sampling. Instead of using the, sa the sampling, you stay there, and I guess you they wait till someone sure. shows up. That's mm -hmm. I guess what would happen. Then they get the first guy, and they ask him, "Well, do you know of anyone else coming in within the next two hours?" So that would give them a better chance of getting more people into the survey. Uh, the, the, the problem isn't so much not getting in enough anglers, it's the fact that the intercepted ones are the ones that go more often, right? So you don't have a way to estimate the number of trips um, because of the, the length bias that's present. So, so that's the biggest issue. Now that said, for the, the coastal household telephone survey, it's a very expensive way to get the trips because they call tons of household and most of them zero, no fishing. So they're in the process of improving that by using um, a dual frame approach, where one frame is people who have a fishing license, but that's biased again, and then they have a second frame, which is general population. So yeah, it's very expensive if they just call and say, hey, did you fish? Most people say no. So. Oui, Jean. Um, I have a question for your double expansion type estimator that you, you've shown. Um, is it easy to estimate the variance? How would you go uh, about it? Well, if we had both pies, it'd be okay. And so now the second pie is modeled, yes. but they're not accounting for that. They're just treating it as if it was true. So they're and fixing it. Yeah, and, and, which is a problem. But on the other hand, it's not a pie, right? It's just an expansion factor. Because if they go in the afternoon and they're saying those people represent the people who go at night, we know that's not true because night fishing is completely different from day fishing. So this is kind of a, you know, last resort approach to fix the problem. 